Welcome to Enter the Unknown, your one-stop shop for answers to questions that you were never bored enough to ask. My name is FJ, and today we've made our way to Hoenn to see if it's possible to beat Pokemon Emerald using the exact team that Ash used for every major battle. We've already tested the Pokemon protagonist's decision-making in Kanto and Johto, and to say he's made some less-than-stellar choices in those regions would be a little bit of an understatement. Ash Ketchum doesn't always select the ideal team, but with the heart of the cards on his side, he never fails to get over the line. We're here to test his selection skills, and the rules are pretty simple. We'll be playing with the battle style on set, meaning we're not allowed to freely switch out after defeating an opposing Pokemon, and we won't be using any items in battle, held or otherwise. I think that's everything you need to know, so let's get right into it. Ash's journey through Hoenn begins in Little Root Town, with just his trusty Pikachu at his side. Like the last video in Johto, by crossing the border and entering Hoenn, Ash's Pokemon have all had their levels reset. So, Pikachu may have Thunderbolt and Thunder at his disposal for accuracy's sake, but the Electric Mouse is back at level 5. Anyway, after meeting May, he heads out a little route towards Old Ale Town, but we can skip all of that. Nothing noteworthy happens until he reaches Petalburg Woods. There, he encounters a feisty Talo and battles it with Pikachu. Even with the type advantage, the Pokemon mascot is fiercely challenged and badly damaged, but eventually Brock convinces Ash to throw a Pokeball, and the exhausted flying type is caught. That marks Ash's first new Pokemon in the Hoenn region, but it doesn't take too long for him to pick up a second. A bit further into the woods, Ash happens upon a Trico who doesn't want to leave the tree that it calls home. After an episode of trying to help out, Ash battles the Trico and ends up catching it to take his team up to three members. That's his last stop in Petalburg Woods, and once he reaches Rustboro, it's time to go after his first Hoenn Gym Badge. Knowing that Roxanne specialises in rock types, Ash decides to teach his Pikachu Iron Tail, which I have to give him credit for, that's a legitimately good decision. For the Rustboro City Gym Battle, he chooses to use Trico and Pikachu, and although that may sound like a really good pick, the Grass Starter doesn't know any Grass type moves. At the time of this battle, Trico only knew Pound and Quick Attack, so that's probably not going to be super useful. Now, you can see she's got Leer and Absorb in her moveset, but they aren't usable. Once we reach the move to leader, any non-anime accurate moves are gone. Until then, they're just going to sit there unused. Trico's at level 12 for this one because she used Quick Attack a few episodes prior and Trico learns that at level 11, so this seems about right. Like the Johto challenge, we're going to keep Pikachu's level in and around our opponent's levels, if possible, because going through this whole game with a level 100 Pikachu probably wouldn't be very interesting to watch. Okay, let's get into it. To keep things accurate, we start off this battle with Trico facing off against Geodude. With only weak normal type moves at her disposal, Trico can't deal much damage before going down to Rock Throw. Pikachu comes in and gets to work with his new move, cracking Geodude with three Iron Tails to knock her out. Although he took a bit of damage, Roxanne's second Geodude can't do anything. Iron Tail knocks her out before she can land an attack, and we're down to a one-on-one. -on -one. Roxanne sends in her Nose Pass, and after a Rock Tomb, Pikachu is left on just 9 HP. Nose Pass spares us by going for Tackle, which, thanks to Static, leaves her paralyzed. With a solitary hit point remaining, Pikachu clambers to his feet and follows up an Iron Tail with Thunder, which finishes off Roxanne's final Pokemon and earns us the Stone Badge. That one felt like a real anime battle, and a great way to start the challenge. Okay, next up, Ash meets with Mr. Briny and has to rescue Pico the Wingull from Team Aqua. Once he's done with that, the Wily Sailor offers to bring him across the sea to Jufford Town, where the next gym is located. On a beach just outside of town, Ash comes across a Corphish who keeps attacking from beneath the sand. Deciding that it can really help out in his battle with Brawly, Ash settles on catching the Ruffian Pokemon. The water type is incredibly strong though, and manages to overpower Pikachu, so Ash has to come up with a fresh strategy. With the help of Trico and a little bit of patience, he eventually succeeds in capturing Corphish who immediately breaks his back. You know, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. When he makes his way to the gym, we get a pretty rare team selection with Ash choosing not to use Pikachu. Instead, he goes for Trico and Corphish in his battle against the fighting type gym leader. If only he had a flying type that he could have used, that would have made things much, much easier for me. At this point, Trico still only had the use of Pound and Quick Attack, so not much use yet. Corphish, on the other hand, had used all of the moves it would ever use. Bubble Beam, Vice Grip, Harden, and Crab Hammer. In the games though, it doesn't learn Crab Hammer until level 35, so I settled on just getting him to level 20, where Corphish learns Bubble Beam. Okay, let's get into the battle. We start with Trico against Brawly's Machop, and after a couple of attacks, she faints to a Karate Chop. Trico's contributions so far have been truly immense. Corphish comes in as backup, and a Crit Bubble Beam takes care of Machop. 
Metatite comes in, and as always, he can't attack if you keep breaking his focus. Corfish easily beats Brawly's first two Pokemon, and it's down to a one-on-one -on -one for our second consecutive gym battle. Even with a Citrus Berry, Makuhita can't stand up to Corfish. A Bubble Beam knocks out Brawly's last Pokemon and hands us another win. That's two for two. Let's move on. Ash and friends sail onwards to Slateport, but the next thing you need to see is inside the gym in Morville City. When our heroes enter, they're confronted by Mechanical Raikou, who Pikachu decapitates with an Iron Tail. You don't get to use the word decapitate often when you're making Pokemon videos. This was a nice change, although it's probably for the best. The resulting explosion overcharges Pikachu, which may not seem relevant, but it definitely is for the upcoming gym battle. In his face-off with Watson, Ash only needs his starter. Pikachu obliterates Magnemite, Voltorb, and Magneton in a matter of seconds, and that puts me in a tough spot. I have to use the same team that Ash did, and I don't really want to overlevel Pikachu at this point. I decided to give a light ball to Pikachu for the gym battle to represent the situation, because I think that's the best I can do. The light ball is a held item that doubles Pikachu's special attack, and I know I said I wouldn't use those, but these are extenuating circumstances. I also got him up to level 24, which is the same level as Watson's Ace, but this is a one-on-four battle where I'm using a Pikachu to take on an electric-type gym, so I think that's fine. Okay, let's give this a go. The battle starts off perfectly with back-to-back -back one-shots on Voltorb and Electric with Thunder. With 70% accuracy, there's only a 49% chance of hitting back-to-back -back Thunder attacks, so this was pretty lucky. After landing a third consecutive hit of Thunder, Pikachu gets paralyzed by a Thunder Wave from Magneton. The Bucket of Bolts connects with Sonic Boom to cut away 20 HP from Pikachu before he lands a fourth Thunder in a row. We're now below 25%, and we're down to yet another one-on-one. -on -one. Mainectric starts off with Howl, and we connect with another Thunder. Make that 17%. We're below 10% if you take the Paralysis into account. Mainectric gets off a final Quick Attack, but with 14 hit points remaining, Pikachu lands one final Thunder that wipes out Watson's Ace and earns us the Dynamo Badge. With everything said and done, the chance of all those Thunders landing was below 5%. This was not a first-time win. I can't tell you exactly how many tries it took, but it was definitely a lot. We needed a high roll just to get past Voltorb, so it wasn't only about hitting every attack. There were a lot of things that needed to fall into place. Mainly, though, I'm kind of shocked this was possible at all. Anyway, let's move on. After earning his third badge, Ash finally decides that Trico needs to learn a Grass-type move, and teaches him Bullet Seed. Now maybe she'll be a bit more useful, although Bullet Seed's pretty terrible, so maybe not. Some more stuff happens, but it's not very interesting, so let's jump forward to Lavridge Town in Gym Battle number 4. We're really burning through these. For his face-off with Flannery, Ash chooses the trio of Corfish, Pikachu, and an injured Trico. Yeah, Bullet Seed's not going to be useful here. For this one, I decided to get Corfish up to the point where he knew Crab Hammer, because this is probably a more reasonable time for him to learn it. But that sort of took the challenge out of this one. And when I say sort of, I mean completely. Corfish just straight up one-shotted Flannery's entire team. They should have just stayed in their Pokeballs for all the impact they had on the battle. In fairness, I gave you three gym battles that came right down to the wire. I'm allowed an easy one every now and then. Okay, with Flannery beaten, it's time to leave Laveridge, and it's been a while, so we should probably pick up a new team member. Ash catches his Torkoal in the Valley of Steel, but that doesn't exist in this game, so the closest approximation we have is the Fiery Path. We're going to be catching Torkoal at level 30, which is a pretty easy one to determine. In its debut episode, Torkoal uses Flamethrower, which it learns at level 30, and shortly after it learns Iron Defense. Torkoal learns that at level 33, so low 30 seems about right. Once Ash is done there, he heads back to Pedalburg for his gym battle with Norman, but on the way there, Trico gets in a battle with Loudred and finally evolves. We know that this happens at level 29, because upon evolving it learns Leaf Blade, and that's the level that Grovile learns Leaf Blade at, so another nice easy one to figure out. When Ash and friends reach Pedalburg, it's time for gym battle number 5. For this one, Ash chooses a nice mix of old and new, deciding to use his trusty Pikachu, his freshly caught Torkoal, and his newly evolved Grovile. Okay, let's have a quick look at the team. Torkoal's at level 34, and she's got Overheat, Body Slam, Iron Defense, and Flamethrower. These are all anime accurate moves, although Ash's Torkoal hadn't used Body Slam yet, so we won't be using it either. Grovile's at level 30, and she's got Pound, Quick Attack, Bullet Seed, and Leaf Blade, which means she finally has a full move set of usable moves. And finally, we've got Pikachu, who's at level 28 with the same moves as ever. Okay, let's get into it. Norman's got a seriously strong team, and the first strategy that came to mind for me was just to max out Torkoal's defense and see where that gets us. 
That's exactly how I started off, but with Spinder repeatedly using Teeter Dance and Psybeam, Torkoal had lost around 40% of her health before even going on the offensive. At this point though, after getting off three iron defenses, Torkoal's defense out of 109 has been multiplied to 436. Right now, Norman could send in slacking, he could put Torkoal's head in his mouth and use Hyper Beam and she wouldn't even notice. A flamethrower isn't quite enough to knock out Spinda, but it causes a burn which finishes him off and hands us the first win of the match. Vigoroth is up next and you know Norman's getting nervous when he's not instructing his Pokemon to use physical attacks. Faint attack doesn't do much to hurt Torkoal and after another burst of fire leaves Vigoroth in red health, Norman is forced to use a hyper potion. That gives him enough time to get off another weak hit, leaving Torkoal with just over a third of her HP. After Vigoroth is defeated, it's time for Linoon. At this point, Norman is certain that he's come up with a counter for Torkoal and uses Belly Drum to max out Linoon's attack, but it doesn't quite work out for him. With the scent of singed fur penetrating the air surrounding the battlefield, Norman sends in his final Pokemon, Slacking. Unfortunately for Torkoal, even Slacking's special attack is pretty damn high, so Faint Attack leaves her in one-shot range. A Flamethrower and an Overheat combine to leave Slacking in red health, but a Citrus Berry slightly remedies that. Another Faint Attack finally overcomes Torkoal, but she's done an incredible job. We switch into Pikachu and he attacks with Thunderbolt, knocking Slacking back into low health. Norman's terrified of losing in front of May and Max, so he breaks out another Hyper Potion to heal up his ace. Between the healing up and the loafing around, Pikachu gets off three consecutive Thunderbolts which brings Slacking back below half health. Sadly, a single facade absolutely crushes the electric mouse and we're down to yet another gym battle one on one. Grovile comes in and with Slacking's ability in play, she's able to get off a couple of Leaf Blades to leave him with only a few hit points remaining. Facade connects again, but this time it's not quite enough. Grovile lives through it with 7 HP and lands a final Leaf Blade to win the battle and earn us our fifth Hoenn Gym Badge. This finish was literally straight out of the anime. I basically copied it beat for beat. I didn't intend to, but sometimes these things just fall into place. Right, let's move on. In the final of the Crossgate Poke Ringer competition, Ash's Taylor went up against James's Dustox and through pure determination, the little bird evolved into Swellow so it could pull through and pick up the win for Ash. In the famous words of Professor Samuel Oak, that is one hell of a pocket monster. Okay. With that evolution completed, it's time for our next gym battle. In Fortree City, Ash faces off against Winona in a 3 on 3 matchup. Ash leads off with his Grovile against the flying type gym leader because he loves to make things difficult for himself. And me. Luckily, he's not completely insane, so he also selects Pikachu and Swellow, which will help out a lot. Here's what our team looks like for the Fortree City gym battle. Pikachu, Grovile, and Swellow are all up to level 32, which is just a level shy of Winona's ace. Considering her team has a two Pokemon advantage though, that seems about right. All of our movesets are anime accurate, although Swellow didn't use double team until the seventh Hoenn Gym battle, so we can't use it just yet. Let's get started. We lead off the battle with Pikachu against Winona Swablu, and this one isn't going to be an upset. Even with the use of a Hyper Potion, the Fortree Gym Leader can't deal a single point of damage to our starter. When Altaria comes in, I figured an earthquake was coming, so I recalled Pikachu and sent in Swellow. The flying type isn't affected by the demolition of the battlefield and hits out at Altaria with wing attack. Thanks to a combination of dragon dances and a critical hit, Swallow gets the better of the half dragon half cloud and leaves us in complete control. For some reason Winona decides to send in her Tropius next and she's not really built to take on a flying type. The only thing she accomplishes is to brighten up everyone's match with a sunny day. Swallow scores another KO with Wing Attack and the Gym Leader makes another peculiar choice, sending in Pelipper and Weather that works directly against her. Not that it mattered much, we send Pikachu back in and obliterate her with Thunderbolt and when Skarmory comes in, the Electric Mouse makes quick work of her too. With a Feather Badge in hand, we can skip ahead a bit because there's not much of note until our next Gym Battle. I know we're going through these quickly, but there's a lot to do in Pokemon Emerald and we've still got some major battles coming. After heading through Lily Cove and crossing the sea to Moss Deep City, Ash reaches the next pair standing in his way, Tate and Liza. The twin gym leaders only have double battles, so Ash picks Pikachu and Swellow, which... Yeah, I'm gonna be honest guys, it's not great. We do have one thing on our side though, Thunder Armor. This is the strategy that Ash famously used to earn his mind badge in the anime, and it's surely gonna serve us here too. Pikachu just needs to hit Swellow with Thunder, and then it will start glowing gold and become supercharged and will win easily. Hmm, that didn't quite work out like I thought it would. I think I must have done it wrong. That one's on me, that's that's not on Ash. Let's, let's try something else. 
I ended up leveling Pikachu up to level 50 and Swell up to 45 before even giving this a proper try because we are at a huge disadvantage. The only moveset change is the addition of Aerial Ace in place of Peck, and with that out of the way, let's give this a try. Tate and Liza send out their Zatu and Claydol to start the battle and we have to double up on the ground type right away. Claydol will always start with Earthquake and that's not much fun for Pikachu so we need to stop it before it gets the chance. A crit wing attack from Swallow does enough to take it below half health and an Iron Tail from Pikachu just can't finish it. God damn it, we're gonna have to double up on crits to start the battle aren't we? It took like 30 tries to just get one. This is going to be miserable. The odds of landing a critical hit is exactly 6.25%, a 1 in 16 chance. That's not bad at all, the odds of hitting back to back crits on regular moves though is 1 in 256, which is around a 0.4% chance. Throw in the fact that one of the moves we're using only has 75% accuracy and we're dropping those odds down to just under 0.3%. In other words, this is going to take a while. I don't know how many attempts this took and I really don't want to know either. It took a really long time and I'd rather not have to do that again, so can we please win the battle this time? We actually managed to knock out Zatu as well without taking any damage, so it's down to the anime battle with our team still at full health. A wing attack and an iron tail take Lunatone out of the air in a flash, and just like that it's down to a 2 on 1. Then after getting Solrock into red health it knocks out Pikachu with flamethrower and all of a sudden any confidence I had evaporates. A Citrus Berry recovers some of its missing health, but Swallow hits one of the most timely critical hits that I've ever had in a battle that was all about them. I don't know what losing this battle would have done to me or this video, and luckily I don't have to find out. With our badge case almost full, it's time to head to Sutopolis City in search for the final puzzle piece. Before that though, we're finally going to fill that last empty slot in our party. On an island between Moss Deep and Sutopolis, Ash's badge case is stolen by a mischievous snow runt. After a battle, Ash catches the ice type and retrieves his badge case in the process. With our full team now assembled, we can continue on to Zootopolis and go after our final gym badge. In the anime, the battle with Wan is pretty unique. It begins with a double battle and once both members of either team are knocked out, it transitions into three one-on-one -on -one matchups. Ash settles on Pikachu and Snow Runt to start and once the ice type is beaten, Corefish is sent in to replace it. Once the double battle is over and done with, Ash's last two picks are Grovile and Swellow. I really want to give Ash some credit here for resisting the urge to use Torkoal. Luckily this battle only required 5 team members because you can't reach the gym without Surf so we needed a fainted Kingler in our party acting as an HM slave. Other than that our team looks like this. I think we once again have just one unusable move on our team, that being Snow Runt's Bite. Other than that I think we're good. Okay, for the final time in Hoenn, let's get this gym battle going. One leads off with Love Disc and we start with Grovile. We quickly burn through his first Hyper Potion after cutting Love Disc into red health with Leaf Blade and as per usual it's pretty useless. A second Leaf Blade knocks out Love Disc from full health giving us an early advantage. Celio's up next and we switch into Snow Runt predicting an Ice type move. It works out for Grovile but not so much for Snow Runt. In his on screen debut he's easily bested by Celio allowing us a free switch out to Pikachu. A single Thunderbolt takes care of the Ball Roll Pokemon. That's not a very good nickname. They should come up with something better. Once again, Wan's choice of Pokemon forces us to switch out, with Whiskash forcing a change to Swallow. The normal flying type knocks out her opponent without taking any damage, taking the Sotopolis gym leader down to two. Kingdra serves as Wan's penultimate Pokemon, and although Swallow's able to get off an Aerial Ace, she's wiped out by Ice Beam. We're now in a three on two. Pikachu comes back out, and luckily, Wan calls for double team. Thunderbolt finishes off Kingdra, leaving only Crawdon, and we've all but won. A final Thunderbolt knocks out the rogue Pokemon, earning us our 8th and final gym badge and opening up our route to the Elite Four. Before heading for Evergrande City though, we've got something important to do. During the Hoenn Grand Festival, Snowrunt battles with Team Rocket and evolves into Glalie. With that evolution complete, we can make our way through Victory Road and ready ourselves to challenge the Elite Four. Unfortunately, the usual complication stands. None of Sydney, Phoebe, Glacier or Wallace appeared in the anime. Out of all of the Elite Four and Champion, only Drake made an appearance. Although he did battle Ash, it was only a 2 on 2 matchup and it was before the Pokemon protagonist even picked up his final badge. Luckily, Ash made a decision prior to the Evergrande conference that makes our decision easy. I'm sure Charizard and all the others would like to get out here and see some action, but Grovile and my other Pokemon have earned it, so I've decided I'm gonna go with the Pokemon I have here for this competition. In all of his full battles during the Hoenn Pokemon League, Ash used the team of Pikachu, Swellow, Grovile, Corphish, Torkoal, and Glalie. 
For the start of the Elite Four, I got the whole team up to level 45, which is going to get more and more underleveled as the battles go on. Swallow and Pikachu are a little higher because of their meeting with Tate and Liza, but other than that, we're level 45 across the board. Every team member has a totally anime accurate moveset at this point, so we're all good on that front. Alright, let's get into it. As we're actually at a decent level for this one, the first Elite Four member shouldn't take long. The battle with Sydney goes down pretty easily. Torkoal takes care of Mightyena before being knocked out by Absol and then Glalie takes over. The Face Pokemon, another weird nickname, cuts through Absol, Shiftry, and Cacturn without taking a single point of damage. That's in spite of Sydney using a full restore. Crawdon is out last and he actually ends up knocking out Glalie before Grovile comes in and finishes off the first Elite Four member. Like I said, it didn't take long. Okay, let's go on to number two. Phoebe is second in line and once again we lead off with Torkoal. A curse from Dusclops forces us to switch out to Corphish and unfortunately he can't do too much. Dusclops knocks him out before Torkoal comes back out to finish what she started. Dusclops number two comes in and she annihilates the battlefield with an earthquake which badly injures Torkoal but not enough to knock her out. A flamethrower burns up Dusclops before we switch out to Swellow but she can't do much to help either. The ghost type knows Rock Slide and Ice Beam, and with that moveset, Swellow can't overcome her. In fairness, she does do enough so that Torkoal has no work left to do when she's sent out. The burn finishes off Dusclops, and when Bayonet comes in, she outspeeds Torkoal to finish her off and take it down to a 3 on 3. Pikachu's brought in, and after a close battle, she just about gets the better of Bayonet, but after a powerful Thunderbolt, Sableye ties it up again with Faint Attack. When Grovile is sent in, Phoebe uses a full restore to heal Sableye right back up. A series of Leaf Blades takes her down before she can deal any damage though, and just like that, Phoebe's down to one. That final Pokemon is the second Bayonet, and Grovile comes as close as she possibly could to beating her. The tight-lipped Ghost just comes out on top, but Glalie comes out last and a single Icy Wind wipes out Bayonet's remaining HP. That hands us the win and allows us to move on to the Elite Four's third member. The start of my footage for the Glacia battle was just me running circles around her. I was trying to confuse her or something? It, it was late, I don't really have a good explanation for it. When we begin the battle, it's Pikachu who starts off for us. Glacia's first Celio is up against him and even with healing items she's helpless to stop Pikachu. When Glalie comes in for the opposition, we swap out to Torkoal and she gets past the ice type pretty quickly. Glacia sends out Walrein and we have to sacrifice Corfish, Swallow and Glalie to get to a point where we can safely knock out the Walrus. With significant damage dealt, Grovile can outspeed Walrein and take Glacia down to two. Her second Celio is sent in, and after taking a Leaf Blade, a Blizzard blows away Grovile, taking it down to a two on two. Pikachu's Thunderbolt knocks out Celio, and when a second Glalie comes in, another Electric Shock chips away around 40% of her health. With an Ice Beam wiping out Pikachu, a one on one with Torkoal is in the offing. We get very lucky when the Fire type comes in, with Glalie using Hail, allowing Torkoal to fire off an Overheat, winning us the battle. That's three down, one Elite Four member to go. Drake is the last man standing in our way, and at this point we're pretty seriously underleveled. We're gonna need a good strategy and a healthy dose of luck. Glalie is our only real hope here. We get to work quickly against Shellgon, setting up a series of double teams before wiping out the dragon with Ice Beam. Now that our evasion is sky high, hopefully we can avoid the attacks of Drake's harder hitters. The plan starts out perfectly with Glalie avoiding Flygon's flamethrower and obliterating the quad weak dragon with Ice Beam. It goes a little off track against Salamence who's more accurate and connects with his flamethrower, but Glalie has enough about him to survive the attack and the Ice Beam he fires back results in another one shot. It's more of the same with Altaria, another quad weak Pokemon getting destroyed by an Ice Beam which leaves only Kingdra. Unfortunately his partial water typing means there's no weakness to Ice for him. That makes things a little more difficult. Glalie actually does just about everything right and leaves Kingdra frozen with just a handful of hit points remaining. Drake doesn't like that though, so we have to put up with a full restore. Then when Glalie wrestles Kingdra back to the brink of unconsciousness, we get to see another one. Getting pretty sick of them at this point. Kingdra finally manages to take out Glalie and then makes quick work of Pikachu before Corfish finishes the job and gets us past the Elite Four once and for all. Now only the champion remains. Well, only the champion in the entire battle frontier. Close enough. Wallace is a water type trainer and even though he's well above us in terms of levels, we've got a very well built team to deal with water types. We're going to speed through this one because we've already spent enough time on the Evergrande conference and this isn't even really the Evergrande conference. This one definitely took a lot of tries and we needed our fair share of luck but eventually we got it over the line. 
Pikachu did almost all of the heavy lifting, but Grovile and Glalie both chipped in with a knockout. Swellow and Corfish sacrificed themselves for the cause, and Torkoal just sort of chilled in his Pokeball while the battle was happening. Okay, we've secured our place in the Hall of Fame, but the Battle Frontier is where Ash really made his name during the third generation of the anime. So, let's take a little trip and get working on that. After being introduced to the Battle Frontier by Scott, Ash starts out by taking on the first Frontier Brain, Noland. In what is one of the most iconic battles from the anime, we get to see Articuno and Charizard face off, but sadly, we can't recreate this one in-game. It really is sad, because that would have made for a damn good thumbnail. If you don't know, in Pokemon Emerald, you have to do a lot of work before taking on a Frontier Brain, and unfortunately, in the Battle Factory, you can only use rented Pokemon. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but I'm gonna need you all to pretend that Ash had a Chansey and a Masquerain, and Nolan used a team of Chimeco, Tangela, and Raticate. Is it just me, or does Chansey vs Chimeco not have quite the same feel as Charizard vs Articuno? On a battlefield where no item usage is enforced, a moveset of Seismic Toss, Shadow Ball, Double Team, and Soft Boil makes Chansey incredibly tough to beat. Aside from being difficult to overcome, it's also a very slow battle strategy. Eventually, she knocks out Chimeco, but Tangela has a frustrating counter for her moveset in the shape of Rest. Getting a bit bored of failing to take down Tangela, we switched out to Masquerain, who easily takes care of the Sleeping Grass type. Raticate goes down even easier in Mind, Body, and Skill. Mind is rated on how many times the Pokemon attacked, Skill judges accuracy, and Body takes the amount of remaining HP into account. I'm gonna be honest, I got really lucky here, and Swellow just swept through Greta's whole team. So, I didn't even get to use the two Pokemon that Ash used. They just sort of sat there. That's my bad. I really didn't want to reload and go back through the battle arena though, so you're all just gonna have to accept that Swellow is better than Greta's entire team. Okay, Tucker is next in line. For his double battle with the Commissioner of the Battle Dome, Ash picks Swellow and Corfish. Although the first two have gone very easily, these battles are incredibly tough, and this team just isn't very good. My mood was definitely not improved by the fact that I went through hours of double battles only to realize that Tucker is a singles-only opponent in-game. The Dome Ace is guaranteed to be using two of Swampert, Salamence, and Charizard. So yeah, this one's a bit of a mismatch. For our face-off with Tucker, he leads off with Swampert, and when we bring in Swellow to raise our evasion through the roof, the fully evolved water starter just keeps trying to use counter. This went just about as well as possible. With four wing attacks, we knock out Swampert before he even gets his shot off. Charizard is up next, and when a crit wing attack takes the fire starter below half health, we are really in a strong position. Overheat incinerates Swellow, and now it's all up to Corefish. Unfortunately, a White Herb cancels out Charizard's lowered special attack, leaving Corefish in a pretty tough spot. I should mention at this point that I was using Hell items for the Battle Frontier because honestly, it's just kind of expected. Corefish was holding Quick Claw here because I was hoping to get to this exact spot. Sadly, the Quick Claw doesn't pop, and Overheat wipes out Corefish before he can get a hit in, ending this one in defeat. I really tried this one so many times, but Ash's choice of team just wasn't good enough. This tweet from the end of day 2 of battling Tucker about sums up how I felt. I just never got closer than this attempt. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? Before moving on to the fourth frontier brain, we have another Pokemon to evolve. Prior to his battle with Pike Queen Lucy, Ash's Fampy evolved into Donphan, and now we're ready for another Battle Frontier face-off. Against Lucy, Ash uses the duo of Donphan and Pikachu, but once again, this is a 3-on-3 battling game, so we're choosing Snorlax to fill out our roster. Seeing as she didn't really get a chance against Greta, this is a nice second chance. Also, Snorlax is really good. Our battle with the Pike Queen is pretty similar to the anime matchup. We start out with Donphan knocking out Surviper, and once she's beaten, we get the Pikachu vs Milotic face-off too. The Water Snake manages to overcome Pikachu, but Snorlax comes in to finish him off and leave Lucy with just her Shuckle. This battle took like 15 minutes on its own. It ran until neither Pokemon had any moves left, and at the very end, Snorlax struggled through and came out on top. There was actually a lot of strategy involved here, because Shuckle had Toxic, and I needed to make sure she ran out of PP for that before Snorlax couldn't use Rest anymore. Anyway, we got through another battle, and now we're more than halfway done with the Battle Frontier. Well, by number of Frontier Brains, at least. Spencer's up next, but we've got one final evolution to take care of before we get there. Ash's Grovile evolves into Sceptile while trying to save a Meganium from Team Rocket. Ash should really be thanking Jesse and James. Half of his Pokemon seem to evolve as a result of their schemes, and they've never really successfully done him wrong. 
With a newly evolved team member on hand, it's time to take on the master of the battle palace, Spencer. Ash chooses Sceptile, Heracross, and Swallow for his match with the fifth frontier brain, but once again, we've got to go over the rules of our new battlefield. In the battle palace, you don't get to pick your Pokemon's moves. They decide for themselves based on their natures. Sometimes they just won't do anything at all. That makes it very difficult if you don't have the best team, so let's hope we do. The battle against Spencer begins with Heracross facing off against Crobat in what is not an ideal matchup. After getting hit by a takedown, Crobat flies up, giving us time to switch out before we're crushed by a four times effective attack. Swellow glides into battle, dodging the first hit, and after a back and forth matchup, the bird Pokemon just about comes out on top. Lapras is up next, and it only takes a matter of seconds for him to take down Swellow and level up the match. Sceptile comes in on our side, and luckily, Lapras is totally set on connecting with Horn Drill. The 30% accuracy move can't land, and Sceptile is able to come out on top with repeated Leaf Blades. That leaves Spencer with only his slacking, and after a Shadow Ball, Leaf Blade gets the job done again. You may have realised that all of my Pokemon only used a single move, and that's because this one was just not possible with full move sets. The trio were consistently picking less than ideal moves, and we weren't getting close to winning, so I decided to give up, delete all the unnecessary moves, and go back through the Battle Palace with one move each. That left them with no choice. I don't think that's technically breaking the rules. What matters is we beat Spencer, and there are only two Frontier Brains remaining. Okay, Annabelle is going to be our penultimate opponent, and for the battle, Ash chooses to use Corefish, Tauros, and Pikachu. That's not the best team, but at least we've got a hard hitter in Tauros. He ends up being a major game changer. Annabelle leads off with her Alakazam, and after paralyzing Tauros with Thunder Punch, he goes down to a crit horn attack. Snorlax accomplishes precisely nothing while getting jabbed over and over again by the Choice Bandit Bull. Annabelle's final Pokemon, though, is... Entei. It takes care of Tauros with ease, and even though we're now in a two-on-one, I'm seriously lacking in confidence. Pikachu's up next and attacks the Volcano Pokemon with Thunder, and even though it deals some serious damage, it's not enough to score a knockout. The Retaliatory Fire Blast blows away Pikachu and leaves us in a one-on-one. -on -one. Corefish versus Entei. Seems like a pretty even matchup to me. This time, the Quick Claw comes into play and Corfish lands a Crab Hammer before Entei can get a hit in, winning us another Frontier Symbol against all odds. Okay, we've only got one Frontier Brain to go. We are so close now. If Corfish can take down Entei, then anything's possible. For the sake of accuracy, we do have to catch one more Pokemon before heading to the Battle Pyramid. After hanging around the main characters for several episodes, Apom eventually ends up in a battle with Ash. A crowd gathers and Ash catches the purple monkey, and none of this really matters to the video because Ash certainly doesn't choose to use Apom against Brandon. But people really didn't like it when I didn't include footage of me catching the unused Pokemon in Kanto, so here's Apom. He's got a hand at the end of his tail. Okay, let's get back to Brandon. For his face-off against the Chief of the Battle Pyramid, Ash goes back to the beginning, choosing to use Charizard, Bulbasaur, Squirtle, and Pikachu. Of course, we only get to use three team members against Brandon, so to make things as difficult as possible, we drop Charizard from the team. Alternatively, I completely forgot Charizard was involved in this battle, so went with the other three instead. I'm either noble, or an idiot, and I think you all know which of those is more likely. Going against Brandon's team of Regirock, Registeel, and Regice with a Bulbasaur, a Squirtle, and a Pikachu isn't exactly a great matchup. We barely scraped past the first team member, and Registeel wasn't even slightly troubled by Pikachu. Let's jump forward to the point where I was getting footage together for this video, and I realized that Ash used Charizard against Brandon, and let's try this again. This time around, we're going to replace Squirtle with Charizard, and maybe this will be possible? That of course means we've got three fresh trips through the Battle Pyramid awaiting us. If you're unfamiliar with the Battle Pyramid, let me introduce you. Seven floors of darkness, your items have been taken, and there are high-level Pokémon everywhere, both in the wild and in the hands of trainers. Most of those Pokémon are keen to paralyze or poison you, and the further into the challenge you get, the more powerful they get. The only items you can use are the ones you find along the way, and it's really not easy. Especially with a team of Bulbasaur, Squirtle, and Pikachu. They are sort of expecting you to show up with a team that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Reggie, so they don't make things easy. Luckily, with Charizard on the team, it's a little bit simpler, but it's still an extra few hours of work for me. Let's jump ahead to Brandon and give this one final try. We start off with Bulbasaur against Regirock, and after getting blasted by an Earthquake, Bulbasaur knocks off about half of the legendary Pokémon's health with a Razor Leaf. 
Apparently we were dealing with a speed tie because Bulbasaur gets in back to back hits and the second Razor Leaf is a crit. Somehow Bulbasaur has taken down a legendary Pokemon. Then for good measure he outspeeds Regice and hits another crit Razor Leaf. It doesn't do too much damage and an Ice Beam cuts down Bulbasaur but his performance will go down in history. Pikachu's up next and he manages to paralyze Regice with Thunder and get off a Thunderbolt but that's all she wrote. Regice one shots him with an Ice Beam and leaves Charizard in a 1 on 2. A single flamethrower falls just short of taking down Regice, but the legendary ice type misses an attempted thunder and Charizard finishes it off with a second flamethrower. When Registeel is sent in, another flamethrower lands and with a critical hit, Charizard finishes off Brandon, giving us a win over the final frontier brain. It's only on a rewatch that I'm realizing how lucky I got here because we did this one on our first try. I feel like I sort of earned that with all the trouble we've had in this playthrough. This took a really, really long time, as you can probably tell, because it's been like a month since the last one went up. I'm so far into this video by now that I don't feel like we need a long outro where I go over my feelings on what went down. We couldn't beat Tucker, but other than that, Ash's teams were able to get us through the entire Hoenn region and the Battle Frontier. Our journey to Sinnoh will happen, but these videos take a seriously long time to put together, so don't expect it too soon. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.